old South American impresarios. The construction of modern cocaine was closely linked to North American policies and practices in Latin America, um, which is to say that drugs have always been a highly transnational and politically inflected phenomenon. Okay. Uh, enough introductions, enough PowerPoint. Well, you can keep staring at them if you like. Um, today's talk I'm going to divide it into two parts. Uh, first, I want to give you this descriptive tour of the emerging cocaine networks and geographies for the 1940s to the 1970s. And then I want to, at the end, give you uh, this two-part kind of political analysis uh, that tries to make sense of the more historical geographic patterns that are found. In terms of geographies, I'm going to start with Peru, which was the place where the cocaine, illicit cocaine was born in the late 1940s. I'm going to move you through some of the important cocaine corridors of the post-war era, and then talk a little bit about Bolivia, of the country that was the incubator in the mid-1960s of a new and dynamic form of cocaine capitalism in the Americas. Okay, so let's start with Peru. Uh, something gonna happen. I'm probably gonna get Peru on my face. There you go. I guess I need a pointer, one of those electronic laser. Guns. I don't care. Really. You point. He's like, can you do the pointing? When I mention the place, right, there, there is one. And right. the... Okay, anyway, Peru. Uh, good place to start. Uh, this is a country that uh, I actually have worked on for most of my academic career. Um, and it was in Peru's eastern Amazonian region, the region that uh, is called geographically the Montaña, um, um, where the Andes meet the Amazon region, subtropical. Uh, tropical regions of Guanaco above today's Guayaga Valley. This is a region of Peru that had a long set of historical ties um, to what was a perfectly legal and respectable national cocaine industry that dated back to the 1880s. And this is the medical commodity of cocaine. Um, it was mainly used for local anesthesia. It was derived from local um, coca leaf, you know, the herbal coca leaf of the indigenous cultures. Uh, but at the same time, it was marketed by um, uh, growing and highly sophisticated global pharmaceutical firms like Germany's Merck. And in fact, Peru's own turn of the century cocaine industrialists had invented and specialized in the export of something that was called crude cocaine, or in Spanish, cocaina bruta, which was a valuable semi refined sulfate coca paste. Um, that Merck and other companies would then refine into medicinal powdered um, cocaine hydrochloride. Um, and not coincidentally, you can really bracket this for thinking about later, um, this uh, crude cocaine of the late 19th century is actually exactly the same thing as what is known today as pasta vasca de cocaína, or PBC. Um, which is the chief peasant ingredient into today's global cocaine trade. Now, after World War II, this cradle of legal modern cocaine rapidly transformed into its opposite, an underground source of illicit cocaine. In 1947, the first clues began to appear in a trickle of sailors on Graceline ships, um, to New York who were smuggling small stashes, really ounces of cocaine in their pockets or luggage. And the likely root of this type of ant trade was the final shrinkage of prior but long declining pharmaceutical markets like Germany's or the tightening restrictions on cocaine by newly collaborating U.S. and Peruvian um, officials. In 1948, U.S. drug agents began their first ever overseas anti-cocaine investigations and sting operations, which were reaching all the way from New York um, to the Eastern um, Andes. And in August of 1949, very dramatically, there was an international cocaine scandal or scare that erupts around the so-called um, Valareso Gang, um, run by Eduardo Valareso, an enterprising Peruvian sailor, which resulted in more than 100 arrests from East Harlem, kind of a revealing, consuming spot, all the way to the Wayaga Valley. Now, on one of those handouts, you have a photograph of 
Eduardo right there, the mugshot of Eduardo Valarezo. Uh, this was the first modern cocaine bus, um, and it sparked uh, a brief flurry of international press time in May 1949, for example, um, dubbed cocaine Pichicata, Peru's white goddess. So you can see the kind of racial and um, gender um, connotation. And by the way, incidentally, just to waste a little time here, um, uh, a couple of months ago, the great-granddaughter, uh, this shows you the wonders of the internet, uh, the great-granddaughter of this drug dealer, Eduardo Valarezo, wrote me an email, and she's a college student at City College in New York, and she said, thank you for showing me this about my family. Uh, I didn't know anything about Eduardo, it was all a big family secret, and she now wants to get together and sort of work together on uncovering more of the dirty laundry of her uh, family's past. Uh, I'm not making that up. She's a nice girl. Uh, we had coffee. Uh, anyway, from 1949 to 1950, we then see an intense wave of repressive measures and missions ranging from the newly founded UN to Peru's own military to wipe out this outbreak of illicit anti cocaine. And what this did was effectively end the older legal industry, uh, indeed criminalizing uh, and jailing many of its uh, prominent leaders. But if this crackdown temporarily displaced cocaine from its eastern Peruvian birthplace, these pressures also sparked a rapid dispersion of the techniques and knowledge about cocaine, especially to neighboring Bolivia, a country which had never experienced the so-called industrialization of coca before, which is actually a euphemism used for the making of cocaine. And so what you see here at the very beginning in 1948 to 1950 is a very early example of what sometimes is called the ballooning effect in drugs. You, know, you crack down in one place and they just simply spread even quicker to another place. And I even found a colorful, detailed document of the FBN that was the Federal Bureau of, of Narcotics, uh, the mid-20th century predecessor to the DEA, which claimed that Andres Soberon, which was, who was Peru's most respected patriarch of legal cocaine, became a kind of Juanito coca seed of illicit drugs that they alleged that he sent some of his underlings off to Bolivia with the formulas for making illicit cocaine, you know, kind of a revenge scheme against the Peruvian government. I don't really know whether that's true or not. Um, but during the 1950s, cocaine gravitated from Peru. Uh, there were some itinerant interests of Cuban mafiosos who would travel to the country. And occasionally, a lab would show up in remote Amazonia. Uh, uh, nor had, in the Peruvian birthing process of illicit cocaine, had the drug really set out any social roots that is brought into play its own dynamic coca growing peasantry. It still it really had just lived off the remnants of the old legal industry or traditional Andean coca markets. This is really the region I've been talking about around here. The central um, Andean. Oh, you got that even better. <laughs> yeah, all right. OK. Um, Anyway, the second uh, thing I want to talk about right now are kind of the intermediate routes and spaces um, for the development of the illicit cocaine um, trade. Um, mobile, long-distance drugs like cocaine need um, risk-taking entrepreneurial intermediaries. They need pit stops and way stations to bridge these remote zones of tropical production, cross-border safely. Um,